We are doing a series of verses today. Um, the third canto, chapter 19, uh, texts uh, 18 through 21. 18 through 21. There are no purports to any of these verses. So I'm just going to read through them and then discuss. Um, I'm <clears throat> this is some of the gnarliest Sanskrit I've been through in a while, so we'll see. Uh, uh, okay, good. Am I on the right chapter? Can't do three chapters. Yeah. Pravavur vayavas chandas tama. No, I'm just going to read through them. It's okay. Pravavur vayavas chandas tama pang savam airayan dig bho nipetur gravanaha. Kshepanai prahita eva. That's okay, good. So you've got the same thing. Somehow I don't remember. Oh, here's the one that I remember reading. Dharnashta bhagaga. Dharnashta bhagana braugai savidyut stanayit nubihi varshadbhi puya keshar shrig. Vin mutrashtini cha sakrit Giraya pratya drish Giraya pratya drishyanta Naya yudha mucho nagha Dig vasaso yatu dhanya Shilin shulin yo mukta Gajha. Let me see, is that the last one? No. One more. Bahu bir yaksha raksho bi pati ashva pati ashvrata kunjarai atatai bir utsrijja hing shravacho. Tivai Shasaha. All right, so that's the verses in Sanskrit, and I'll read through the English. Yeah, I wish I could see the number on these as I was looking at them, but I can't. Fierce winds. This is the Pravavur Vajayas Chandas verse. Fierce winds began to blow in all directions, spreading darkness occasioned by dust and hailstorms. Stones came in volleys from every corner as if thrown by machine guns. <coughs> so I'll reread all of these twice just so that it's easier to grasp what's being said here. Fierce winds began to blow from all directions, spreading darkness occasioned by dust and hailstorms. Stones came in volleys from every corner as if thrown by machine guns. The luminaries in outer space disappeared due to the skies being overcast with masses of clouds, which were accompanied by lightning and thunder. The sky rained pus, hair, blood, stool, urine, and bones. The luminaries in outer space disappeared due to the skies being overcast with masses of clouds which were accompanied by lightning and thunder. The sky rained pus, hair, blood, stool, urine, and bones. O sinless Vidura, mountains discharged weapons of various kinds, and naked demonesses armed with tridents appeared with their hair hanging loose. O sinless Vidura, 
mountains discharge weapons of various kinds, and naked demonesses armed with tridents appeared with their hair hanging loose. <clears throat> is this the last one? Yes, it is. Cruel and savage slogans were uttered by hosts of ruffian yakshas and rakshasas who all either marched on foot or rode on horses, elephants, or chariots. Cruel and savage slogans were uttered by hosts of ruffian yakshas and rakshasas who all either marched on foot or rode on horses, elephants, or chariots. Um, so this section we're reading here has been following this uh, battle scene between uh, the demon here in Yaksha and the Lord in the form of a boar as Varahade. Um, this will go on for a little while. Yesterday our um, uh, Natabar Garanga told us about a uh, nice e explanation of the uh, muhurtas and other things. And uh, today, um, I kind of want to focus on a couple of different items, but I wanted to ask first, before I even start, if anyone has a particular question about something in reference to this section that we're going through about the fight between the demon and uh, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We'll see if anybody has anything buzzing around already in their heads. If not, we'll go on, but we'll take a look here. Okay, so we'll move on here. Um, the demons have a plan. They have a plan for themselves. They have a plan for the world. And as we know in Bhagavad Gita, uh, the demons uh, say that there is no God in control and that uh, this world is produced of lust only. And they are engaged in unbeneficial, horrible works meant to destroy the world. Um, today, I want to kind of... Um, I like the way that uh, Arjuna Nanda did the class the other day, and it reminded me what I try to do to create kind of a uh, pivotal m metaphor or comment that kind of is the center focus or center target of the entire verse, you know, so or the entire class, so that it's easier to pin things back to a center point. So my center pivot today will be kind of a road analogy, you know, like sometimes you're driving in a car and you're driving on the road. And uh, I'm going to pull off that in two different ways. Uh, the first way um, is that in the material world, we want to do what we want. We don't want any restrictions. But that's exactly similar to driving a car and saying, I don't want to follow this road anymore. You know, I'm driving down the road and the road is turning to the left. I don't want to go to the left. I want to go straight. So you can do that. <laughs> But what will happen immediately when you do that, you know? Depends on, of course, where you are. But you'll either go into a ditch. Maybe if you're in Arizona, you can get away with that for a while, you know? Uh, the road curves left and you keep going straight, you know? If you've got an uh, all-terrain vehicle, maybe you can manage that for a little ways. But uh, um, that's kind of... Uh, the way our lives are. We do have the ability to speed up and slow down. We do have the ability to take this exit or that exit, but we really don't have the ability to go off-road, at least with our cars that we have. As a matter of fact, what happens when you get off the road right away is that you notice things getting bumpy. 
So if we decide that we're going to chart our own course, we're going to do our own thing, it's exactly like getting off the road. And um, immediately you notice that things are getting very, very bumpy. And um, the further you get off the road, the bumpier and wilder things get. And you might even wind up losing sight of the road. You might wind up in a marsh somewhere, spinning your wheels where the car won't move at all. Uh, you might wind up um, getting arrested. You might wind up uh, going off a cliff. You know, All these things are possible. So um, this is... A warning, you know, uh, and, and this is just a, a metaphor, this road metaphor, um, makes us aware that even if we're not really interested in Krishna consciousness, we still have to stay within certain rim limits or certain parameters. But if we're interested in Krishna consciousness, we're going to get the smoothest road and we're going to wind up at the final destination. So um, this brings me to a quote by a, um, a Greek uh, sophist named Protagoras, which Protagoras said, man is the measure of all things. In all things that while they are, they are, and in all things that while they're not, they are not. <laughs> so... Uh, this is actually a philosophy that we encounter all the time. It's a philosophy that we bump into all the time. That what you think it is, it is. What you want it to be is what it is. If it's true for you, it's true for you. It may not be true for me, but it's true for you. And for me, what I think is true is true for me. Uh, and this is a classical uh, argument uh, of the, the Greek sophists. Now, I want to preface this a little bit by saying that I don't think it's necessary to know or understand all these, uh, you know, philosophers from ancient Greece or any of this stuff. I think certainly uh, devotees should get very, very well grounded in understanding Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam, you know, because uh, that gives you the clearest perspective. But as time moves on, uh, we will be presented with, assaulted with various other points of view. There's no uh, escaping it. It's the nature of our world. We were all raised not in an agrarian culture, but in a culture where um, people talk about ideas, about contrasting philosophies, etc., etc. So it's impossible to escape, you know. But, you know, we can take it a little bit at a time, you know, uh, a little bit at a time, and we can kind of see how Krishna consciousness, it uh, relates to, say, the other religions, Christianity, Islam, um, you know, uh, Judaism, Buddhism, etc., etc. We can also see how Krishna consciousness relates to various philosophies like um, idealism or uh, atomism or the sophists, which are kind of, I'll get around to them maybe later on. But um, we can also see how Krishna consciousness relates to the modern, more atheistic, scientific you know, viewpoint. All these things are in our external environment. Um, and even if these things weren't out there, even within ISKCON, there will be, you know, various different contending views. And uh, um, like those uh, early storm warnings that you get on uh, the news, uh, there's a storm headed this way. <laughs> I'm not going to say any more about it than that. And if we do our job right, you will never know it. But uh, we don't really know how it's going to turn out. 
at any rate, I'm going to move on. Um, at any rate, the idea here is that we have to kind of get an understanding of how um, Krishna conscious philosophy works and how philosophy in general works, how to understand things at a deep level, uh, and how to recognize when somebody's using an argument that is actually not a very good argument. It's an argument that uh, is either specious or it's based on uh, premises that are in, inaccurate or incorrect. So um, philosophy is kind of like, I think, intramural sports. I'm going to use another analogy here. Intramural sports that, uh, you know, that in philosophy you have to have some sports gear. You know, you can imagine playing ice hockey without any gear. I mean, what would you be able to do? You don't have a puck. You don't have sticks. You don't have ice skates. You don't have a score, you know, net. Or <laughs> how would you even play it, you know? You just sat on an ice pond. You know, you could use regular uh, broken pieces of stick or something like that. But you need some gear. And in a, a sport, uh, we also have some rules. If there are no rules, then what kind of a game are you playing? You know, so even basketball, you have to have, uh, you know, probably all you really need is a hoop and a, and a court and a, a basketball, you know. So uh, that takes less, but still you need those things. And you have to have some rules. Otherwise, people could just, you know, punch you in the face and then put the, you know, which is not allowed, you know. So, uh, you know, there, there's, there are rules to the game. So in philosophy, there are too. But usually people don't understand that there are <laughs> rules in philosophy. And, and that's why oftentimes arguments become bottomless pits. But um, in general, we can understand that in philosophy, the uh, rules are, you know, various ways that both people accept how we're going to explain or talk about our two opposing views. And the sports equipment, in this case, is the basic fundamentals that we will use or we won't use the things that we will either both accept or one of us will challenge. So um, some people are not aware that you can't make any philosophy or any th theory or statement about anything without accepting something as a fundamental. You know, like in mathematics, mathematics is probably the most cut and dried of all the <coughs> possible things to talk about. Still, you know, we have to accept that a line is the uh, closest, uh, the shortest distance between two points. There's no way to prove that. No uh, geometer has ever proven that. But it's accepted. If you don't accept that, nothing else works. And so similarly, everything has a starting point. If I say, I believe this because of that, you can say, okay, I understand you believe this, but I question that. Okay, so then you say, well, I'll explain why I believe that, and then you explain that. And then the person can say, but I want to know why you believe that. You know, it's like the, the child's question of why, and then the answer is given, and then the child follows up with, well, why about that? You know, you can just go endlessly that way. So somewhere you have to start with something. And those things are axioms or fundamentals, whatever you want to call them, and they can't be proved. Whether you're talking about science, whether you're talking about Christianity, whether you're talking about the Vedic literature, no matter what you're talking about. So, um, back to my road analogy, I want to go back to where you go depends on what you set your compass on and what path you take. It's not that you will go anywhere uh, where you go will depend on what you use as your guide and what path you take. You can choose the right guide and go the wrong path, or you can choose the right path 
and have the wrong guide and you'll wind up veering off at some point in the future. So um, that's why we learn about the Vedic knowledge that we're hearing every day and we try to understand it and we try to put it in our consciousness and we use it as our guide day to day and we try to apply it as best we can. We're going to fail to some extent, some percentage of uh, uh, what we should do, have to do, need to do. Uh, we'll get not done or done incorrectly or whatever, but we will carry on. Um, so I wanted to read a little bit from, uh, I may wind up doing this, um, our uh, Gopal Champu and I talked about restarting a Wednesday evening program um, for people who are a little further along, maybe, or something like that, in Krishna consciousness. And um, I'm still thinking about the format to do that. I wasn't able to do that until maybe the beginning of next year, but that's pretty soon now. Um, so we'll see how it goes. At any rate, um, it's very interesting the way Bhaktivinoda Thakur uh, also sort of scopes over, you know, various philosophies, demoniac and saintly and the whole thing. So I'll, I'll read uh, one section of this and then uh, kind of go further into it a little bit. So this is kind of actually written a little bit like... Uh, Plato, you know, a little bit of a dialogue. He's having a dialogue sometimes between himself. So, the self, this is the first uh, aphorism where he is, maybe the third uh, sloka. He, he writes a sloka in Sanskrit and then explains it. Atma prakti vai chit driyad dadhati chitram uttaram swasvarupa stito hyat Ma dadati yukta mutaram. The self, due to the variegated nature of its conditioning, gives many, many answers to these questions. The questions were who am I, what is this world, and what is my relationship with it? The spirit soul situated in his original form and nature need indeed presents the true answer. So here's the purport. So the, the translation of his own self-written verse is, the self due to variegated nature of his conditioning gives many, many answers to these questions. The spirit soul situated in his original form and nature indeed presents the true answer. So this is Bhaktivinoda Thakur explaining why there are so many philosophies in the world. Both scripture and philosophy attempt to answer these three questions. And a fortunate person who is turned away from sense objects finds the answer to them. In India, these answers were delivered by Vedanta, the Vedas, and other literature which follows those scriptures. Different answers, however, were provided by philosophies that misinterpret Vedic wisdom. Examples of these are karma mimamsa, vaisheshika, nyaya, patanjala, and pseudo-sankhya. Those are the six darshans that we spoke about last week a little bit. And they're kind of described in this book by Suhotra. Um, besides these, other answers to the questions are provided by philosophies that are in overt opposition to Vedic wisdom, such as Buddhism and Charvaka's atheistic philosophy. There are many philosophies giving many different answers, such as, such as the answers of materialism, atheism, pantheism, secularism, positivism, skepticism, and pessimism. These were promulgated in ancient China, Greece, Persia, as well as France, Italy, England, Germany, and other countries in the world. Logic was used by many philosophers to prove the existence of the Supreme. In other places, however, a concept was promulgated that one should simply believe in the Supreme Lord and worship him. In many religions, a claim was made that the religion was originally delivered by the Supreme Lord. Some religions were anchored 
in the individual's own personal faith in the supreme, and that is known as theism. Christianity and Islam are among religions with scriptures and belief systems given by the supreme. Answers to these three questions, again the three questions are who am I, what is this world, and what is my relation with it. Answers to these three questions are actually two different types. The answer is given by the liberated soul situated in his original form and nature, and the great variety of differing answers given by all those who are not situated like this. Why not a single answer? The reason is that true answers are only given by a purified personality, one who is situated in his original spiritual form and nature. All persons so situated will give the same answers, but fallen souls are not situated in their original spiritual forms and natures. The material realm is not their actual home. The Paratattva or Supreme Truth is Parashakti, a higher spiritual potency. Maya Shakti, the potency of illusion, is the shadow potency of that Parashakti and is the mother of the external world. Fallen souls residing in the external world accept a great great variety of material qualities offered by Maya Shakti. They believe these qualities as their own. They accept a specific mixture of these qualities and an identity offered by Maya Shakti. In this way, the conditioned soul identifies with matter and his original qualities are withdrawn. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur is actually stating there that um, when a person is purified of their material consciousness, they see the world as it is. They see things in one way. They give the same answers to the same questions. However, because most people are not in that condition, They have their mind colored by various material desires. And because they have various material desires, they do not see things the way they are. And they are clouded by various misconceptions. So naturally, any logic or putting together of the way philosophy uh, should be put together for life is going to be faulty. And this is going to produce a myriad of different possible answers to various philosophical questions. Material ideas are mixed with spiritual ideas in the mind of the conditioned soul in different ways. As such, the conditioned souls, misidentifying with a different mixture of material qualities, give their own answers to the above-mentioned questions. Thus, a great variety of different answers influenced by association, language, cultural activities, tradition, foods, and various patterns of thought in the countries where the conditioned souls reside. Time, place, circumstance, in this way, amalgamate to form many variegated natures. At the very beginning, spirit souls come into contact with matter in different ways. These different contacts bring out one set of variegatedness in nature. Next, according Another set of variations transpires due to different countries, families, languages, and other related circumstances. The original variety of natures thus becomes multiplied by further variety. Only a person who has traveled and learned all these languages and who studied the history of each and every one of those countries could actually understand the scope of this multiplicity. I shall only direct your attention to that variety. I shall only I shall only direct your attention to that variety. It would be very troublesome to do more than this. In relation to the above mentioned two kinds of answers, only one of them is the true answer. The other is according to many different philosophies and thus contains very great variety of answers. That extensive variegatedness may be divided into two. The first is called jnana and the second group karma. 
someone may then protest. You imply that you honor yukti or logic as the way to know the truth. Logic begets the other great varieties of answers. Then why don't you accept them? I respond to this protest as follows. Spiritual logic does not depend on material logic, which begets a variety of answers. As such, when I use the terms yukti and yukta, logic and truth, I am referring to that logic and truth accepted by liberated souls who are completely pure and no longer affected by the touch of material nature. That logic and truth distinguishes precisely between matter and spirit. Taking shelter in matter, material logic, inevitably leads to a great variety of conclusions. The genuine true answer, the actual logic an- logical answer, is derived, is rather delivered by a liberated soul situated in his original spiritual form and nature. The other group, known as Gyan, is seen among a great variety of answers. The conditioned soul tries to distinguish between spirit and matter by utilizing gyan. When that gyan articulates positively, it is called anvaya. It asserts that matter is the root of everything, primeval and beginningless. When that gyan assert, articulates negatively, it is called vyatireka. It says that matter is simply a transformation of Brahman, which has no potencies, and that matter cannot be annihilated. The follower of the other group of answers, known as karma, asserts that souls here should engage themselves in material activities because the Supreme Person does not exist. The pure form of jnana and karma have their place in genuine spiritual love and action. They are both parts of the true answer to the above-mentioned three questions. These pure forms will be discussed subsequently in our work. Words are unable to completely describe pure absolute truth because they are material in nature. So, what Bhaktivinoda Thakur is saying there is that um, There is a way of putting together philosophies, what he's calling logic and truth. Um, And a person whose mind is not cluttered with the wrong sporting goods, with the wrong foundational elements, a person whose mind is not hampered by misviewing various things and interpreting them in the wrong way, a person who has not formed a whole roomful of misinterpretations, misunderstandings, mishearings, such a person will be able to see their way through and make a reasonable conclusion. Someone who has all those problems, someone who has wrong foundational uh, principles, someone who has misinterpreted things, someone who wants to see the world the way they wish it would be as opposed to the way it actually is, someone who has an entire um, collection of such foggy, mysterious, and incorrect ideas, such a person will certainly give the wrong answer to all those things. Such a person will have their compass set on the uh, wrong goal, and such a person will be taking the wrong road to get there. Both things, you know. So what happens when you set your mind to the wrong goal? Well, most people will set their mind to the goal of material happiness, which we know never works. It's a great idea, uh, seems straightforward, somehow never works. But go ahead and try it, you know. So most people have their minds set on that. Uh, But they think that the way to get to material happiness is by their clever arrangements that they have worked on for a long time. And when that fails, as inevitably it will, then they're lost, you know. So the car has gone off the road, the car may be headed for a swamp, you know. So uh, that's the nature of um, uh, the mind being cluttered with the wrong 
foundational principles, with the wrong goals, with the wrong perceptions of the world around us, and all of those taken together, that's why we say that uh, the mind has four uh, frailties, or we have four uh, wrong things. Um, mistaken, uh, we are mistaken, we have imperfect senses, uh, we are, uh, have a tendency to cheat, and we are in illusion. So, um, we can be, uh, we can see our senses are imperfect. We look at something, we think a rope is a snake. It's not a, uh, it, there are snakes and we see a rope, but we think that that rope is a snake, which makes us act in an inappropriate way. Uh, we have, uh, um, we make mistakes. <coughs> we come up as a basis of thinking a rope is a snake, we begin to make some plant to deal with the snake when actually it's a rope. So we make a mistake. Then uh, we are in illusion in general. So that's when the whole room gets uh, smoggy and smoky and we can't see our way anywhere. A person doesn't know where they're going. They don't know how to get there. <clears throat> they have some vague idea of wanting material happiness, but that's about all they have. So such a person's whole view of the world of philosophy in general is really hopeless. <clears throat> and finally, we cheat. After all that's there and done, we say, no, I'm fine. Everything's good. Uh, things are happening the way I want them to happen. I'm, a, I'm up. You know, how about you? You know, I'll put, post it on Facebook and uh, you can see my... Uh, uh, trip to France or wherever it was, you know, Eiffel Tower behind us. We're taking our duck face selfies and the whole thing, you know, so uh, all that's there, you know. That's uh, kind of the way the material world works. So um, the demons, they have their whole uh, view and they think that whatever they think is as good as what anybody else thinks, but since they're powerful, whatever they think, they're going to force it on everybody else. So that's their nature of, um, of doing things. And this is certainly what um, uh, here in Yaksha was doing. Um, I was doing a little investigation. As far as the demons go, um, we learn that... Um, those who are uh, descendants of Diti are called Daichas. That's a phonological transformation. From Diti comes Daicha. So the I uh, turns into an I, AI. So Diti becomes Daicha. So the sons of Diti are Daichas. They're also sons of another one of Kasyap Muni's wives. Uh, uh, Dana, which are there, the Donavas. So you have the Deitches and the Donavas, and they are both kind of impious groups. Uh, as um, Natavargarang was talking about yesterday, we have also the Yakshas. They're also kind of an um, inauspicious group, but not quite in the same category as the uh, demon, demons and the Donavas. And, um, you know, Diti. Uh, she had several sons and some of the prominent demons uh, we have of course here in Yaksha and, here, and Hiranyakashipu which are the chief Hiranyakashipu had four children Pralad, Analad, Halad and some, some other Alad I forgot <laughs> what it was so uh, he had those and, and of course um, we have um, mm, interestingly that here in Yaksha and Hiranyakashipu Kashipu had a sister, and her name was Himika. I don't know anything more about it than that. You know, I didn't really do a uh, search into what she is known for, if anything. And then we have Surapadma, Simlavakrita, Tarakshura, Gomuka, and Ajamuka. So these are some of the main demons. And uh, so uh, these are at least the original ones, 
and they go down. Of course, um, when there was the churning of the milk ocean, which we also heard about very recently, uh, then many demons were killed as a result of that. And when the demons were killed, um, Diti, who was very aggrieved that many of her children were killed in that um, battle, uh, asked her husband, Kasya, to do a sacrifice so that she could have a child that would murder Indra. So, uh, of course, Kasyapa thought, oh, you know, face plant and the whole thing, that uh, this is what my wife wants, you know. So, um, but he knew well that if he told her to do devotional activity, in the process of the devotional activity, she would get purified. And Indra immediately found out about it. So he was um, thinking, you know, I've got to be very wary. So Indra hovered around and uh, he thought, you know, I'll wait for her to make a mistake. So one day, you know, she was doing this whole ritual of doing things a certain way. One day she forgot to wash her feet before she went to bed. And Indra thought, aha, now I've got my time. So he entered her womb and he saw the embryo there and he cut it with his um, uh, you know yeah his thunderbolt he cut it into seven pieces and then he cut those seven pieces into seven pieces and so uh, seven sevens 49. 49 right so seven seven we have 49 and those uh, when they were being cut the second time they cried out and said please Indra don't cut us anymore we are your brothers and we are not your enemies so something about the sacrifice had gone quite opposite as the way Diti thought and they became the Maruts and so uh, that comes from Ma Rudha Rudha means to cry out they were crying out so Indra said don't cry <laughs> So uh, he told them not to cry out, and but they became named the Maruts, and they're actually oh, we got the drooping microphone phenomenon here. Okay, that should do it. So, in other words, Indra uh, was able to uh, pacify them. All right, so I want to leave some time for any questions or comments. This was kind of a uh, a talk that covered a few things, but I tried to stay within a certain kind of center, center pivot. So we'll see if anybody has any questions that they would like to put forward or comments or uh, corrections. Do you think that um, Bhaktivinoda Thakur was open to the idea of there being self-realized souls in other traditions who would answer the questions in the same way or only only in Gaudiya Vaishnavism or only in Vaishnavism or only in Hinduism or what? Well, I think uh, in general Bhaktivinoda Thakur was uh, certainly open to the idea that uh, other people in other traditions would answer those questions in the same way. But I think they would be rarer. You know, because um, to really purify a, a person internally, you have to betake yourself to a pretty rigorous process. You know, now I think there are people who somehow or other have gotten there. You know, um, but we have a process that's actually quite chalked out and uh, we know the pitfalls we know the drill you know what we should do what we shouldn't do and, and we work at doing it so we have pretty good odds you know whereas I think it still does happen you know and um, there's certainly people who are very very advanced how they got there I don't know but they got there you know so uh, um, in that way I think too um, probably Bhakti Vinod Thakur seems to have a similar thing because he's quite, you know, he, unlike other Acharyas, he did not grow up in a Vaishnav family, you know, like most of our other Acharyas did. He grew up in a family that were basically Shakta worshippers. And uh, his whole life is a journey through uh, Shakta worship, 
other Vedic uh, formulas. He went through Christianity. He went through Islam. He, you know, looked at various other religions. He read various philosophies. And he was a prolific author. And, um, you know, uh, eventually he ran into the Tagores, which were, you know, really taken with Ramohan Roy and his whole deal. So he went through all that stuff. And then eventually he came to feel that Vaishnavism was very important. And when finally he was able to read a um, not uh, adulterated version of uh, Bhagavatam or Chaitanya Charitamrita, I forget which one, at that point he became convinced that this Vaishnavism is really where it's at, you know, so... Uh, he he kind of went through the whole thing, kind of in a similar way many of us Westerners did, you know. We didn't just get born right into it. Yeah. Yes. Um, you were talking about the metaphor of being on the road, and I was just wondering maybe if you could go over that again. And I was just thinking, like, you are saying, okay, so we don't really have... Like we think we have free will, but we're on the road. We we'd have the free will to speed up or slow down, or to take an exit. But if we just try to go off road, then the car's going to break. So I was just wondering if you could like connect that metaphor. Yeah, you know, right. Just, like, well, you know, in general, as we see with the demons, you know, they're they're feeling that um, you know. I make my own way in the world. Whatever I want to do, I do. You know, famous Frank Sinatra, you know, I did it my way. <laughs> and what's more than this, I did it my way. <laughs> so the idea is that um, they have no respect or interest in um, any kind of universal system or any kind of universal restriction. Uh, they make their own uh, path. And if that means going right through somebody else's front lawn, then it does, you know. So uh, we go back to the, uh, the analogy being that um, even a person who's not interested in Krishna consciousness knows that there are some uh, parameters that you have to stay within, you know, and generally they do so for social convention or for simplicity or whatever it is. But for us, we know that we have a much more narrow road, as the Christians say. We have a, a straight and narrow to follow. And um, because we do, uh, we know that we are like people on a, on a highway, you know, that uh, it makes sense to stay on the road. And it makes sense then to also know what exit we need to take. So we uh, are staying on the road rather than just to think, well, today I feel like I want to drive off the road. I, you know, I have, I'm coming up on a left turn. I'm going to stay going straight. So we go off the road and then pretty soon the first thing we realize, we don't have any idea where we are. Secondly, the terrain can change so uh, drastically that we'll get stuck or we'll have a flat tire or something like that. You know, Most cars aren't designed to go off the road. Or, uh, and so this is what happens when people uh, feel that there's too many restrictions. I want to just do what I want. So, okay, do what you want, but it's kind of analogous to driving off the road. Is, does that make it any clearer? Or? Okay. So, um, these, uh, I was really kind of this morning reading uh, this book that's put together by Suhotra about the um, uh, six darshans, and it was describing nyaya, because Bhaktivinoda Thakur had mentioned the word nyaya or logic. Nyaya is an entire um, whole wing of Vedic knowledge that discusses the whole concept of 
how to put ideas together in a, in a proper way. In other words, it is what we would call in the Western terminology epistemology, how we uh, learn what is a good argument, what's a terrible argument, uh, what kind of things we're putting together, how we're putting them together, and um, what, excuse me, is a structured way to do that. And um, <clears throat> I'm sort of compared a little bit that to Western philosophy, which uh, starts, of course, with the Greeks. And it seems like right away the Greeks stubbed their toe, you know, on this whole idea of is there change or no change, you know. Um, this is also discussed in um, the philosophy of um, uh, the Vedas, you know, this idea of uh, vaivartavad or parinamavad, you know, that uh, um, the um, Shankaracharya said that uh, the Supreme Lord is unchangeable, therefore everything is illusion. And this is exactly where the Greek came to, that same concept, you know, that because the Supreme, they didn't think of it as a person, they thought of the Supreme as some thing, whatever it is, the all one, is unchangeable. Therefore, Parmenides said, therefore, uh, there is no change. Everything is um, stationary. And all change, all motion, everything is illusion, you know, which seems like a crazy idea to hold, but that, that was what he thought. And on the other side, you had Heraclitus, who said, there is nothing but change. Everything is changing. So how to reconcile these two views? I mean, that's where Greek philosophy started out, you know, with do things change or they don't change, you know. Uh, and Heraclitus said, you can't step in the same river twice because uh, when you step in the same river the second time, you're not the same you and the water that you stepped in is not the same water. And uh, so everything is constant change. So this, the Greeks wrestled with for quite a while before they kind of brought the two together, but also in a clumsy way, you know, with, um, you know, the... Uh, bringing together of the idea that things change. There's one world that changes and another world that doesn't. The world that doesn't is the world of platonic absolutes, you know. Uh, in particular, um, first was Pythagoras was saying it was mathematics that never changes, but everything else does. And uh, then later on, um, the world that does change is this world, which changes everywhere. So we had two things. We had for Heraclitus a world that always changes this world around us, and for Parmenides we had a world that never changes, the world of mathematics or the world of um, platonic, whatever you want to call them, absolutes, you know, so something like that. And then eventually you have three groups uh, drip, dripping out from that like a precipitate or something like that. And the first group is uh, uh, Socrates and Plato, which are the idealists saying that everything comes from the one whatever it is, you know, the highest whatever it is. It isn't a person, it's something, you know. And then you had the second group, which were the atomists, who said that everything comes from atoms. Not quite exactly the same thing as <clears throat> what we have in India, the uh, you know school of um, atomism in India, which was Gotama, you know. Um, and then the third group were the sophists, who didn't believe anything, but uh, they made a lot of money. Uh, and <laughs> the way that they they made money was by teaching people how to. Um, use rhetoric the way lawyers do to gain political power and to, um, you know, influence others. So that's why today sophistry is kind of a stinky term because uh, they um, basically were uh, the people 
who knew how to win arguments without any regard for what was actually true. They didn't have any interest in what was actually the right thing, but they knew that when you win an argument, there are certain benefits for that. And so they were a class of people, like actually an, an occupational uh, guild, whose basic purpose was to teach young people how they could win arguments and gain political power. So that was the third group, you know. Uh, and, of course, it goes down from Western philosophy after that. But already at this point, in India, you had Nyaya, you had, uh, you had atomic theory, you had uh, the um, Sankhya philosophy, you had the yogic uh, whole school. All this had already well been established before any of the Greeks got to any of this kind of business. Um, and um, they had answers for these things. But, you know, uh, every time you hear some Greek coming up with a new idea, usually it's a spin-off from one of these ideas that come from the Vedic system. But at any rate, I digress now. So uh, any, we, unless there's another quick question, we'll cap it off here, and, and I'll end for today. And I'll thank you all very much for your kind attention, all glories to Srimad Bhagavatam, all glories to the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord. Hare Krishna.